Morning, church. Morning. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen on this beautiful Sunday morning. I can see a few tired eyes. Thank you, Daylight Savings Time. Uh, you know what we're going to say next. If you would like to join us in worship, we have space available. Please call the church office by noon on Friday or register online. Easter is coming, so if you want to get acquainted with the space before then, we hope to see you soon. On behalf of the Racial Justice Committee, we're having another panel tomorrow at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Um, you can register by noon on Monday to be here in person, or to uh, you can also just hop on Facebook Live as well. And this will be a moment where some of the members of our committee share what they've learned what they're thinking, feeling, uh, and where they want to be next. So we hope you consider supporting members of our congregation and being here in person, but for sure tune in online if possible. Lenten concert this Wednesday at noon. Irish music, is that right, Brenda? Seems timely for our St. Patrick's Day. So that'll be in person or on Facebook Live noon this Wednesday. Reminder that March 19th, that's Friday, there's deadlines for ordering Easter flowers. Uh, these order forms are on our website. And this is something Nancy Liardi and our Christian Ed Commission have put a ton of work into, a women's virtual retreat. That is this Saturday, March 20th. Signups are due by Friday at 10 a.m. And there is a Eventbrite link on the website. I, I hope you consider checking this out. I know Nancy's put a lot of work into this, and she's really proud of this event. Uh, it'll be rewarding for all who attend. And our deepest condolences to the family of Jean Hyde, her passing Monday, March 8th. Jean was 92, lifelong member of this church since 1956. Her husband, Bob, passed away in June of 2020. And together they had three children, Robert, James, and Susan, who all grew up in this church. Jean was ordained as an elder in 2005. She was on our personnel commission. She was ordained as a deacon in 2010 and uh, a member of our Concord Bell Ringers for years. Yeah. So we send our heartfelt thoughts to her family and friends during this time. With that, please rise if you are able. Join us in the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. Let us thank the Lord for God's steadfast love. Let us proclaim of God's deeds with songs of joy. Let us worship God. You may be seated. glory great things he has done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. All oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Great things has taught us great things he has done and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son but purer and higher and greater will be a wonder a transport when Jesus we see praise the Lord praise the Lord let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give 
Hello, my young friends. Please come closer to your screens so we can have a moment together and welcome to those of you here in the sanctuary this morning. We have a special tr tr treat this morning with the puppeteers are here. We welcome Greg Schaefer and Ernest Agana. Their story is about the power of prayer. So let us begin. Today we're going to make believe that we're in a TV studio and we'll be meeting a famous TV reporter. Ralph Rogers here from WNPR Metuchen News, the world news that comes alive and is alive. And we're here to talk to our viewers about the power of prayer and the power behind prayer. Praying is so mysterious, Mr. Rogers. That it is. And we're going to find out and crack the mystery behind this power of prayer. Prayer has power? We believe so. Evidence is overwhelming, I must say, that there is power in prayer. Do you have any examples? I sure do. And there's no better place to look into the power of prayer than the book which we call the Bible. That's true, Mr. Rogers. Many historians, historians use this book called the Bible to find out about things that have happened thousands of years ago. And Jesus used the power of prayer when he was tempted in the desert, I have come to find out. How long was he in the desert? We know that Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, which is a long time to be without food. That was a long time, and Jesus must have been very, very hungry. Oh, I'm sure he was, but the power of prayer seemed to give him strength. That was a good one, but are there any other examples? How about when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Gethsemane who? Gethsemane. Where was that? Well, I did some research and found out that the Garden of Gethsemane was at the foot of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. What happened there? According to the Bible, Jesus prayed for strength to do God's will and die on the cross for our sins. And this is, and was, an amazing development. Are we all sinners? We are, and Jesus wasn't, I have come to believe. Why would Jesus die for our sins? Ralph Rogers is all over this story. And this is a WNPR Metuchen World Exclusive. My parents told me the answer is that Jesus loves me. Yes, the Bible does say so, and I believe this is true. Do we have time for one more example? When Peter was in prison. What happened? Peter was put in chains and surrounded by 16 guards. It seemed impossible for him to break out of prison. But I remember in the Bible that there is nothing impossible with God. Peter prayed, and his friends prayed. Then what happened? An angel of God appeared and freed Peter of his chains. Then the angel led him out of the prison, and Peter went to his friends. That's amazing! And that's the way it was. WNPR Metuchen World Exclusive on the Power of Prayer, signing off. Thank you for visiting with us, Mr. Rogers. And thank you for having me. Will you pray with me? Dear Gracious God, we thank you for hearing each and every prayer we pray to you. Please guide us to listen to you and make good choices. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first lesson comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, 
verses 1 through 13. Please listen for the word of God. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. No one can do the signs you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of spirit. What's born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Don't be astonished that I said this to you. You you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we've seen. Yet you don't receive our testimony. If I told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one from heaven, the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second scripture reading continues in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Hear now the word of God. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the power of your Spirit, Open your word and illumine our hearts in this, in this darkened world, that we may see clearly and live faithfully by the light of your Son. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and accepting to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's not in my nature, but I spent a lot of time reflecting this past week. Tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of our church going virtual. As an, and as I noted in the pastor's piece of the March Parish News, this marker of time will impact everyone differently. Some will grieve. Some will be angry. But we all will need to wrestle with this sense of what we've lost. For my own journey... I went back and watched the March 15th, 2020 Sunday service. The first thing I noticed is the stark contrast to the week prior, adorned with the backdrop of a choir full of light blue robes. Alas, the following Sunday, our first Sunday back from Israel and the whirlwind of that trip, it was just the four of us, Nancy, Brenda, Fred, myself, all tan, very weary from jet lag. No clergy robes, as we didn't feel it necessary on such a Sunday. In reality, apart from Jonathan in the back, we were alone in a very large, empty sanctuary. The looks of uncertainty on our faces, the feigned presence of optimism that this crisis would be temporary in nature, the urgency to do something, but unsure what something is. Nancy's encouragement that we should hand sanitize as much as possible. And our collective unknown of how important masks would become. Behind all this was a collective resolve to still be the church. And it was mixed with a fear and trepidation of what could possibly happen next. And that collective resolve never wavered throughout our session meeting that Tuesday as we realized we couldn't have Easter services or gatherings since our numbers of COVID were skyrocketing. And even with this reality sinking in that this is going to be long term, this congregation has had a collective resolve to be the church. And that has been a blessing. As you all too well know, this time last year, our country was implementing a nationwide lockdown, restaurants, gyms, schools, all closing their doors. I remember last year on this very day, leaving our Metuchen YMCA gym for the last time. The sweaty stragglers, myself included, as we're exiting the doors, the staff were lining up greeting us, saying goodbye. See you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. It wasn't till September that I saw them again. 
Additionally, the endless conversations last spring with our college youth, they were promised beyond spring break and maybe a two-week hiatus, they would be back on campus. Some of our college youth still haven't returned. Our high schoolers are coping with utter disruption and the dull familiarity of virtual learning. Amidst it all, throughout this past year, we've experienced loved ones lost, life disrupted, uncertainty at every turn, and the fear of what we cannot see. And through it all, this pandemic began in a season of Lent. And here we are a year later in the next season of Lent. For some of us, does it even feel like the last season of Lent ever ended? And on this fourth Sunday in Lent, our, our lectionary, it, it leaves us with the most cliche and challenging of texts. Nicodemus's conversation with Jesus leading up to the most iconic of verses. And in truth, the lectionary chooses to leave out the first part of this passage, which Fred read, of Nicodemus' skepticism, and it jumps right to the, for God so loved the world, salvation part. But to do so is a shame on the lectionary editors, and it's very problematic because it removes the context for which Jesus is speaking. So we'll, let's get the context. Nicodemus, a leader and a faith scholar in the community, he comes to Jesus in secret, in a place of uncertainty, and he wants to know more. He is questioning everything in order to understand. And in reading through this passage, I couldn't help but place where all of us, pastors, staff, congregants, were at this very moment last year into Nicodemus and his questions. How can any of this be? Asked Nicodemus. How can the world be so dark and broken? How can we know anything? How do we know we're doing the right thing? This kingdom of God, how are we seeking it? And most importantly, where is God in all of this? And Jesus' response to Nicodemus, which maybe can be applied to us, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And as sarcastically as I can respond, thanks, Jesus. How reassuring. Thanks for laughing, Gail. The Gospel of John, being as simple in its vocabulary and as incredibly complex in its word use, it offers the most well-known verses in the entire Bible. The answers we seek to how are these destructive and upending events allowed to be come from the knowledge that our creator God loves. And how God loves is an answer every person who's grown up in Sunday school knows by heart. God loves by sending God's son. And in loving, God offers a path out of darkness towards the light. And for many evangelical Christians, John 3.16 and the verses that follow, they're a template for salvation. If God loves the world, then God offers God's Son as a sacrifice, taking the punishment in our place for our darkness. And as problematic as that can be, all one has to do is believe in God's offer and you're saved. Born again into a new life of faith. And for so many Christians, especially in our country, what isn't there to love about this faithful form of religion? Simple, easy, digestible. I choose to believe, I'm in. Faith becomes an individual mandate only. You can remove the community accountability and the constant need for evaluation. After all, it's just belief. And this belief is what gets you in and saves you from the fiery damnation of hell. It's for this reason why you see John 3.16 signs propped up everywhere, especially as protest amongst football games or even Mardi Gras. If born-again Christians believe that the world is in darkness and Jesus is the get-out-of-jail-free card, why wouldn't you proclaim that all it takes is to believe in John 3.16? You'll be saved. The sinner's prayer, as it's so often known. 
And as simple as this prayer may be, the living out of these words are so intentionally not easy. Believing in the love of God, it's the first step. Nicodemus figures this out, and this is why I so greatly appreciate him in this gospel. It isn't belief only. There's so much more to the process. A life of faith is exactly that, a life. This is a journey, and it doesn't begin or end with a simple prayer. The author of the Johannine Gospel chooses to use Nicodemus as a pawn in the conversation, and, and then moves on to other things in Jesus's ministry, and we're left wondering, where is Nicodemus? What has happened, and what does he think of all of this? But Nicodemus reappears later in the gospel. So applying some context, we understand that in asking the hard questions about faith, Nicodemus doesn't back away. Rather, he sticks around. Engaging with Jesus, this learned academic, is poking and prodding. And eventually, as our gospel concludes, we find Nicodemus assisting in burying Jesus, even as the rest of his disciples disappeared into hiding. What's that all about? Why did someone who had it all figured out prior to Jesus continue following Jesus around? Tradition tells us that Nicodemus is the unofficial, timid apostle. Always present, but taking his time and accepting what Jesus had to offer. And this is what I value most. Nicodemus' journey. His journey of discipleship. He offers us an example of what the journey looks like. It isn't a quick acknowledgement of what God does. Rather, it is an acceptance of the mysterious love that surrounds us. And the journey to reflect this love in all that we say and do. Perhaps in the season of Lent, Nicodemus is our example of what faithful living looks like. After all, for Nicodemus and for us, this Lenten journey is about following the light of Christ so we can become that light. Following Jesus, going along in the journey of discipleship, living as light in the world is truly about being led closer and closer to the very heart of God. Now, there's a lot that goes on in this journey. And unlike so many of us Christians, we like to assume it's about being moral and pious. But that isn't the destination. But loving your neighbor as yourself is essential. Creating a utopian kingdom of heaven come to earth in this world, it remains elusive. But trusting in God's kingdom means we denounce and resist the kingdoms and empires of power, greed, and exploitation in anticipation of the world to come. This journey isn't about progressive states of greater and greater joy and peace and happiness, but it will involve trusting that in all the moments of joy, anguish, hope, and despair, God is holding you as a mother. And while all these things that happen along in the journey, we are told that ultimately the journey leads to God. For Nicodemus, as for us, the discipleship in Christ leads us to God. Our Christian life is a journey to God. And this, this, friends of God, is why we have Lent. For all the giving up of oneself that so often takes place during this season, such as eating fish on Friday for our Roman Catholic friends, or a social media fast for the younger generations, Lent is a reminder of our journey. And typically, the major themes of Lent are things like repentance and forgiveness, mercy, sin, penitence. These are not usually uplifting topics. And this year, these rather difficult topics, they overlap with the one-year anniversary of not being in church together. The one-year anniversary of being told, see you in two weeks. The one-year anniversary of when we could last travel and see distant loved ones. It's completely understandable to have trepidation about this Lent. Because the last one feels like it never ended. Some of us may even ask, did Easter happen last year? If you're feeling any of this trepidation, 
I want to offer another side of Lent. In the early church, one of the things that made Lent so distinctive was its connection and preparation to baptism. The 40 days of Lent was the time when candidates for baptism, they prepared intensely, and it would culminate with baptisms on Easter. And it wasn't just a journey for the candidates, the whole community was involved. In the early church, during those 40 days, the entire church would pray for the candidates for baptism, and those candidates would be honored and given special attention, and the assembly would take this time to reflect on their own baptisms, spending time in prayer, recommitting themselves to their baptismal identities. We're children of God. Sure, of course, this involved repentance, being honest about sins and faults, being aware of our pain and brokenness and the darkness of life. But those weren't the destination of the journey. That wasn't the centerpiece. The centerpiece, the destination, is baptism. Being identified and committed to this journey by declaring yourself a beloved child of God. That's the goal. Just as we hear in Jesus' baptism, in whom I am well pleased, this is my beloved. We hear the same. It's the same promise to us. We are joined to Christ's own death and resurrection and adopted as God's own beloved children and whom God is well pleased. So in Lent, we see a, a, a tension. On the one hand, Lent involves the struggle of giving up oneself, asking for forgiveness, being honest about who we are, shaped by the brokenness of the world. Same time, we know that this place that we're headed to, the ultimate purpose is that we're connected as divine children, dwelling with God. There's a creative tension here. And in this tension, there's something we can learn. It's not that one is right and the other is wrong. They're both right. And they're both incomplete. And many Christians throughout this past two millennia, they've discovered that God is present precisely in this tension. The tension of struggle, loss, and pain. Being held within a larger context of love, liberation, and restoration. God can be found in the movement back and forth between these things. Getting too stuck on the miserable, miserableness and failures and pain, it will quickly lead to shame, guilt, and despair. And being lost in the blessing of John 3.16, born again without the journey, it leaves you disconnected from the reality of the world. But if you can hold these tensions together in your life, you might find that it's liberating. God came to us in the person of Jesus. From the birth of God entering our world to the cross where God saves our world, Lent points us to Easter, the light entering the darkness. So I pray we can all be more like Nicodemus, skeptically asking the questions as a form of discipleship, embracing the unknown and all the fears that come with uncertainty for the sake of the journey. After all, God in Christ has come to dwell with us. God has come to dwell with you right where you are. In the midst of your tears and grief, Christ is there. In the midst of your hope and joy, Christ is there. When you love your neighbor as yourself, Christ is there. When you confront injustice, Christ is there. While asking for forgiveness, Christ is there. While feeling God's love, Christ is there. And yet for all of us, for some reason, it takes us a whole journey just to discover God is here. Amen.
Would you rise if you're able? Before I bid you peace, I just want to say for those who are watching, peace be with you. I can almost hear it. I'm trying to hear it telepathically. It doesn't always work, but I try. Let's try it this way. Peace be with you. Share the peace. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jennifer Thompson, and I'm one of the elders of our church. Um, so during the pandemic, the elders of our church have gone to meeting twice a month. At our first monthly meeting, we discuss the ongoing business of the church, and at the second meeting, two weeks later, we discuss the challenge of keeping the church open during the two times where the virus spiked. Each one required a lot of consideration and debate. Trying to find the place of hope is often elusive given, given how upside down life has become. At our last meeting, though, we started to discuss hope in a new way. As the vaccine is being administered, there is a growing sense that the pandemic will end. Yet, we are also mindful that as hope grows, we just held a vigil for the 500,000 lives lost in the past year. As we move to gather the parts of this prayer, the tension of these, two, of these two things, hope and loss, seem to shape the words of each elder. Please join me in the elder's prayer. God of mercy, we give you thanks for our loved ones and friends who are being vaccinated. Please give patience and calm to those who are waiting for a turn. Our hearts are filled with awe when we try to imagine more than 30,000 meals being assembled and more than $18,000 being raised at our famine. We give you thanks for the Temple Emmanuel for becoming a partner in bringing food to the hungry. 
We thank you for the crocus and snowdrops and the daffodils beginning to rise. We revel in the return of warmth, but also the possibility of spring and a new start to our lives. We pray for our youth that this time of the year will have a bit of normal. And we continue to pray for the teachers and all of those in health care. We also pray for the people who have stocked the shelves of the grocery stores and kept deliveries going. Give mercy and courage to families where COVID is touching many and whose impact lingers. Help us to be mindful of the quiet struggles. Let us find our neighbors and st stay to hear how they made it through the year or what they hope for the year to come. Forgive us for growing impatient and testy. Let us be mindful of the fatigue we are feeling and give mercy to ourselves and others. We pray that you would make us wise. There is so much we cannot see. We have turned a blind eye for so long, we no longer see the truth beyond our own concerns. Give us the grace to redeem instead of discarding. Let our hope grow stronger right now. We lift these prayers up to you in, prayer, in the prayer your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And let us not fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
although I hope to never hear the false promise, see you in two weeks, ever again, something touched me this past week. Uh, There's an aged mother who was fully vaccinated. She was able to see her adult daughter and children for the first time in a year. And they hugged, tears in all their eyes. Reminder of the destination in our journey. So friends of God, in this journey of Lent, the journey's all around us. Embrace it. Seek the God Son that brings us towards the light and our destination. Go in peace to love and serve. Amen. Hello friends, good morning, let's start with a song.
Mrs. Day. Thank you, Elaine. And we will see you on your Zoom class right now.